Hello, I'm Jim Burnett with the ninth program in our series, NASA and Aeronautics. Our series now brings us into the 1980s. In this show, we examine some of the projects that NASA is planning to focus on during this decade. New types of aircraft and the use of computers are just two of the areas of work that NASA anticipates will make the 80s another successful decade. In our opening film, we see the ingenious Gossamer Albatross on display at Johnson Space Center. I suspect that you know the Albatross was not a NASA project. We also get our first glimpse of the complicated XV-15 tilt rotor. This is a project that will receive much of NASA's attention in the 80s. The challenge? Fly a heavier-than-air craft from mainland England to anywhere on the mainland of France. Under competition rules, the aircraft could have no assistance from motors, propellants, gases, ground crew, and no in-air launch. A cash prize of $200,000 to go to the first successful flight. Roger, sir. Yes, we hold you on radar at this time. On June 12, 1979, 26-year-old Brian Allen flew the pedal-powered Gossamer Albatross across the English Channel to France, winning the prize money for the aircraft's designer, Paul McCready. The Gossamer Albatross has a 94-foot wingspan, weighs 70 pounds, and is covered with mylar, a very thin, lightweight plastic. It is shown here on display at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, alongside full-scale training mock-ups of the Space Shuttle Orbiter. To learn more about the craft's maneuverability and performance under varying conditions, NASA just completed research tests with the Gossamer Albatross sister ship at the Dryden Flight Research Center in California. Pilot Brian Allen explained. And we were trying to find out really what the stability and control and performance characteristics are on this airplane. It's the sort of thing that uh, no one has really ever built an airplane quite like this before. So it's unique in a lot of ways. Uh, since it's flying so extremely slowly, flying very close to the ground, and it has a very big wingspan, and is controlled in rather unconventional ways, too. There's a lot of, uh, lot of unusual things about it that NASA was interested in from just the re basic research standpoint. And since it is really the world's most efficient human-carrying airplane, flies on a quarter to a third of a horsepower, it may have applicability towards a high-altitude drone-type aircraft that NASA is interested in building in the near future. This is the XV-15 tilt rotor research aircraft. It too is scheduled to undergo flight testing at Dryden. What makes the tilt rotor unique is its ability to combine the efficient, precise hover and landing characteristics of helicopters with the speed, range, and endurance of current turboprop airplanes. And it does it with fuel savings of one-third to one-half, nearly doubling the aircraft's range over helicopters. When the proof-of-concept flight testing is completed, engineers at NASA's Ames Research Center will begin an applications evaluation program. In addition to obvious military applications of the tilt rotor, the unique aircraft is generating considerable commercial interest for uses ranging from intercity transportation to help reduce congestion at busy airports to shuttling crews and equipment to and from distant offshore oil platforms. From the simplicity of the unpowered Gossamer Albatross to the complexity of the dual-purpose tilt rotor, NASA's interest in aeronautical research continues at many levels. Now we have two back-to-back -back films that were made in 1981. The first clip is an indication of how flight research can aid in other areas. 
In this case, highway research is aided by the knowledge gained in aeronautical studies. The second clip is an account of how aircraft can be used for Earth observation purposes. NASA's role in studying things aerodynamic has ranged from several decades before the Second World War to the reusable space shuttle now being readied for its first flight. Using similar aerodynamic scaling techniques, NASA has been assisting in a Federal Highway Administration sponsored project that may one day help engineers improve the design of tunnels and highways. This facility is 110 feet long the reason for that length is for the level section to be equivalent to about a half a mile long. So one could have about five sections of three tunnels and two no tunnels, about 500 feet long. And that gave us uh, enough tunnels in a row such that we can observe the recirculation of the air from tunnel to tunnel as it gets dragged from one tunnel to the next by the movement of the cars or actually backs up to go to an adjacent tunnel. We have two lanes of traffic such that we can have the traffic either going in the same direction or in opposing directions, just like would happen in a real highway. Frequently, freeways and tunnels use up large areas of land that might better be used in other ways. The researchers are experimentally depressing and partially covering simulated freeways in an urban area to find out how much and how little tunnel is needed. One of the tests involves injecting trace gases that act like hot automobile exhausts. Coupled with carefully controlled wind and temperature measurements, airflow patterns can be determined that may help designers build more efficient highways and tunnels in the future. This is pilot Jim Barnes preparing to fly one of NASA's high altitude U-2 aircraft. The place is the Ames Research Center in Northern California. High-flying Earth resources planes routinely carry aloft a variety of sensors, aerial mapping cameras, electronic scanners, and devices to sample air from our atmosphere. A new aircraft called the ER-2 that can carry nearly two tons of instruments to an altitude of 13 miles will be delivered to Ames this month. Since each of the planes makes about 100 flights a year, Scientists acquire very good data over wide geographic areas as the seasons change. Information is being gathered about our impact on the Earth's protective ozone layer, as well as in the fields of pollution monitoring, astronomy, and Earth observations. High-quality pictures have been used to update old maps, study urban growth, locate new water sources, and to map and describe cropland. The planes can scan shorelines, assess flood damage, and help fight forest fires. When Mount St. Helens erupted, NASA sent its high-altitude observatory on an air sampling mission. These pictures were also taken. Observing our Earth from above, an expanding role for high-flying resource monitoring aircraft. Now we take a further look at the complexity of the XV-15 tilt rotor. In this film, we see how far NASA has come in developing this airplane that uses helicopter takeoff and landing patterns and normal plane operations for cruising. During the 80 years since the airplane was invented,